finally come to chapter 6. So I hope you've done your reading this week. And I hope you did your homework that I asked you to do, if you were able to. And so we come to the part of the Revelation where it is a very prophetic style writing. It deals with the future events for its readers. We notice at this junction that this is the last of the three natural divides of the book, the letter. This is obvious because the very large section of chapter 6 ends at the end of the letter. It starts, starts with chapter 6 and ends at the end of the, the letter itself. But nevertheless, in chapter 1, verse 19, it gives us the natural threefold sections of the letter. John is told, write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So, this was a threefold commission, as we stated in the introduction, given to the Apostle John. He is to write the things that he has seen in heaven. And this would relate to that glorified, glorified vision of the Christ. The things which are, and that is the letters to the seven churches, the condition that they are found in, and Christ's personal message to them. Because he knows their works, and he knows where they stand for him. And finally, the things which shall shortly come to pass. So these things are to be the hereafter, the prophetic part of the whole letter. So here in this natural threefold divide, we have past, present, and future. What does that remind you of? Past, present, and future. Our language. Language? Dickens wrote about it. Dickens wrote about it. Ebenezer Scrooge. The past, the present, and the future. We all have a past in our own personal lives, don't we? And we are now living in the present, and tomorrow is the future. So chapter 6 then begins with the future section of the letter, the natural section of the letter. The first section of uh, this, the last section, the section 3, is also divided into three sections. The first section we're going to look at is chapter 6 to the end of chapter 11. The period of time that is covered in this letter seems to me uh, from John's stay at Patmos in the reign of Domitian, remember, in 96 to 98 AD through the end of the Gospel Age. Now some say we're living in the gospel age right now. In a sense we are, but in a sense we're not. And we'll find that out later on in what I mean by that. And so if you read chapter 11 and verses 15 and 18, you will see that natural divide in the section. Because this section ends at this point. In chapter 4 earlier, we saw that John sees the 24 elders worshipping the one that sits on the throne. And they sing a new song. Remember, we talked about that. Thou art worthy to receive power. Now, if I said that dead is worthy to receive his power, does it mean that he has power already? No but he will receive power. And so, to receive power then that the 
24 elders are singing means that the Lamb in the plan of the, of the one sitting on the throne has not yet started to come into fulfillment. But at the close of the ages, at the end of this chapter 11, we see that the 24 elders sing a completely different song. We give thee thanks, for thou hast taken thy great power and hast begun to reign. So there's a difference, isn't there? A difference in its text, in its tense. So when we get to chapter 11, we see the combination of the religious plan unfolding, God's plan unfolding. So in other words, <coughs> in other words, it is a panoramic view of the human history. And it's described in two different ways and in two different reasons. The first section has to deal with the physical side of the Roman Empire. And the second section, where chapter 12 picks up, Towards the end of the book, the letter, we see the spiritual battle of the Roman Empire. So we get in these two sections an entirely two different sets of symbols. And as I said, one points to the pagan Roman Empire, and the other points to the spiritual apostasy that takes place within the Lord's body and that empire. So physical power and spiritual power. So thus we see the church, the body of Christ, in two major conflicts. The first conflict is with the political, physical, physical power of the bosom of the Roman Empire, the pagan Rome. Secondly, there is a conflict of the spiritual power, the painful power, the apostasy that takes place within the church and the empire. And then thirdly, the last section is talking about the return, the judgment of all mankind. And to how we treated the one that sits on that throne, you see. So in chapter 1, Ned, could you read the first two verses of chapter 6, verse 1, from the good old King James verse, please? What do you want now? Revelation chapter 6, okay. verses 1 and 2 in the old, good old King, old King James. And I saw the lamb over one of the seals, and I heard. And there was a noise of thunder. One of the four beasts say, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Thank you. So let us get right into chapter 6 then. In those two verses that never occurs. As I've already stated, when the lamb breaks the seal, Part of that scroll, part of the panoramic history of the world is revealed to us. We notice the procedure. At the loosening of the first seal, there's a similarity within the next three that follows. Each time the first four seals are loosed upon the earth, the four living creatures, in a voice of thunder, it says, cries out, come and see. It seems to me as if the four living creatures are taking their turn one at a time to announce the great events that are going to take place in human history. <laughs> Under each of the first seal, we see four horses. And under the seal of each of the first four seals, we see that there is a rider. And that there are certain peculiarities between the horse and its rider. So first of all, what about the horse? Well, we first have to 
determine the significance of each horse. The first horse is what color? White. White. Well, that's important, isn't it? To know that the horse is white. The first thing we must do to look at and understand about the horses is, is as I've said, we have to go back into the Word of God to find out what the horse is and, what, and bring all those references to play. When you read Job chapter 39, 19 through 25, it describes the horse as a warlike animal. And that's why in Isaiah 31, 1 through 3, we read that the horses were used by the Egyptian army. And the Jews put their trust in those Egyptian horses, and they didn't place their trust in who? God. God. It is also why, according to Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 16, the Jews, the Hebrews, were not permitted by God uh, in breeding horses. Why weren't they allowed to breed horses? Because they were a warlike creature, a warlike animal. And of course, the Jews being the Jews, they always seem to find a way of bypassing what God told them not to do. So do you know how they bypass not breeding horses? They simply purchase them as an import from the Egyptians. Thus they said, we didn't break God's law because we didn't breed but we purchased the horse. You know, man he always tries to think he can outsmart God, right? Did you know that Solomon <coughs> had stables for 1,000 horses? Big stable, isn't it? So the color of the horse. The four horses I mentioned in the seal each has a different color. So each color of the horse means something. And it means something of importance, and we have to understand that. So the first one is white. In a warlike animal, white symbolizes what? Victory. Victory. It's true. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, we see the Lord riding what? A white horse. And that symbolizes whose victory? His victory. There is another important point here to bear out what John writes uh, about this vision of the white horse. Did you know that in Rome, a white horse had a special symbolism throughout the whole Roman Empire. In example, a general returning from the battlefield with his army would camp outside of the city of Rome, two miles outside the city of Rome, on the edge. And he would camp there while the Senate was meeting to declare if he was worthy to have a ticket type parade. And that parade, if he was worthy, was long. He would march through with his army, and the prisoners he had captured would be placed there, and they would slay some of the prisoners along the way to show how mighty he is. And at the tail end of the whole parade, he would waltz in, you know, just like Santa Claus at the end of a parade, right? He would waltz in with his family walking behind while he walked Rome on white walls. If it was deemed worthy, a triumphant entry. So the Senate had to decide, and it was the Senate who decided who would or who would not based on the 
merit of the warlike battles they fought. So John Sargent says he's a white horse. He would instantly think of victory, triumph, and a triumphant battle period <coughs> in which a general would all <coughs> sin and have that ticket type parade. <coughs> so what about the rider? The fact that he rides a white horse indicates to me somebody who has been victorious in war, in battle. But we are also given other details about this rider. Have you noticed the rider is not named? None of the riders are named. One of the things it describes that he has a bow. This rider has a bow. That's what he carries. So what does that mean? It must be something about warfare, right? People who do not believe in the inspiration of the Bible, they may find what I'm about to tell you just trivial. It doesn't mean anything. Okay? But I'm not one who thinks and believes that way. When we're dealing with Bible now, with prophecy, and especially with revelation and with the details, we have to look specifically at the significance of that detail. In fact, as we look at the four writers, we will find that each one carries something different. This one carries a bow. The next one carries a great sword. The <coughs> next one carries a set of scales and balances. And the last one carries death. Remember now, with any part of the scripture, scripture will explain itself. <coughs> When it comes to dealing with the symbolic book of the Bible, especially this one in Revelation, we must compare the symbolism with other things that are found in the Bible because the Bible doesn't contradict itself. Some of us like to think it does, but it, I've never found a contradiction ever. And I know there's people who've been in the faith longer than I, and I doubt that they have ever found it a contradiction in the Word of God. If you get something representing one kind of thing here, then it's going to be exactly the same elsewhere. There's no differences, you see. So when we get to the horse, the symbolic battle of the horse. That means then, when we read about the horse, it will represent warlike characteristics. It's going to remain the same. You will never get in the Word of God a camel representing the symbol of war. You will never get in the Word of God a mule, a donkey, or an ass representing war, because they represent something entirely different, you see. A horse is a horse, a donkey is a donkey. They're different. So then we have to simply get to understand what this apostolic type literature in the Bible and its symbols are. And mark my word, they are very consistent. If you say a white horse stands for victory here in Revelation, it's going to stand for victory anywhere else in the Word of God. So the writer carries a bow, and the bow is quite a weapon of war. However, this man is a warrior who goes forth conquering and to conquer. To me, it's pretty obvious that the bow is a weapon of war in the hand of this bride of this man. It also says in that first two verses that 
he wears a crown. So this writer then wears a crown. Did you notice how that is phrased? Because once again, that is very significant, isn't it? It's very important the way God has phrased this wearing of a crown. It says, a crown was inherited by him. It's a difference, isn't it? To inherit something, Prince Charles inherits the throne of Great Britain. And after Charles, it goes William. And after William, it goes George. And after George, it goes Charlotte. See, they inherit the crown. But this writer, the crown is given to him. It's very significant. And as the crown is given to him, he goes out conquering and to conquer. So the significance of the way that comes across to me is that the writer did not get the crown as a result of inheritance or of victory. He had the crown before he went out to conquer. And to me, this is a man who symbolizes some royal authority in the Roman Empire. He has authority over Rome, but the crown is given to him. It's not actually his. And then he goes out to conquer other lands. So then, I asked you to do your homework, if you could. Let's try to identify then this writing on the white horse, the horse of victory. John is told in the third part of the natural divide to do what? To write the things that are to happen way down in the future of history. To write things that will shortly come to pass, immediately come to pass. Not way down in the history. Things that will shortly come to pass. Meaning that the events that will take place will shortly begin to come to pass. You understand? Now it's in my view whether you accept it or not, that's your own business. Because I do not think anybody to do on the revelation is infallible and certainly not mine. I'm not claiming to be infallible, you see. Far from it. But this is my own persuasion. It's my own view of the revelation. To have, to have some kind of significance at all to John and to those believers who were suffering persecution in Asia Minor. You have to look at an early commencement date to the beginning of the start of all the prophecies that will take place. And that's exactly why the words are things that must shortly begin to come to pass. To read those words and then say that these events in the letter are still yet to be fulfilled, even in our generation, makes absolutely nonsense to me. It really does. And yet we have people that believe that the events have not come to pass yet. Okay. So you think uh, yeah, Revelation is 100% historical? Yes, I do. I do not. Because it is a history period of the world. Not saying every detail of every year and every event is recorded in, in the Revelation. I'm not saying that at all. But it, I believe it is snapshots of the period of history of what's going to happen to the church 
physically and then spiritually. And then the return of Christ. That's how I view it. But you're entitled to what, what, how you do it. You're entitled to it. To me, these two verses have nothing to do with carnal warfare. I think it has to do with uh, Ephesians 2.17 says Christ will go forth with the gospel. Mm -hmm. So this, all of this represents is what's going to Even in our day, it happens. I mean, I, I'm going to make a point in the future about in a little bit about that, okay? And then you can see from my perspective where I disagree with that viewpoint, okay? I personally think we have to begin around the time of Domitian when John was in exile on the island of Patmos. This does not relate to something that's, that has already happened, but it, it relates to something that is shortly to begin to come to pass. So I personally believe that if we get the first seal wrong, we get that first seal wrong, then everything else we want to say will be wrong also. So it's very important to understand what the first seal is talking about. So is it possible, or should I say the real question is, do we find something in history, a period of triumphant warfare within the Roman Empire that flows closely to 96 AD? Because that at least would suggest to me that it would be very helpful in getting off to the right start in this prophetic prophecy part of the letter. By the way, you would understand too, I'm sure, the importance of what I've just stated. For if you're going to interpret any prophecy in the line of history, the importance of starting at the right point is important indeed. Because if we get it wrong at the beginning, we're going to be wrong all the way through, all through the rest of the letter. And that is why it's very important to me to try to identify what is really meant in this first seal of the horse and its rider. <coughs> so, with that then in view, let me try to explain to you that there is a striking fulfillment of these very first two verses of chapter, chapter 6 in the reign of the Emperor Trajan. Now, you have to remember that John was exiled in the reign of Domitian, and the letter of Revelation was written in the last year of Domitian's rule, of Domitian's reign. Domitian died in 96 A.D. In actual fact, when you go back into history, what Domitian was afraid of for a long time actually came to pass. He was assassinated. Who came to the throne after Domitian? Well, it was the Emperor Nerva. He came to the throne in 96 AD. The importance of the accession of the Emperor Nova is that it commenced the most prosperous and triumphant time in all of pagan Rome's history. The family of Domitian had lost the throne. And with the, with the ascension of Nerva, it marked a new dynasty in the Roman history. A new set of five rulers followed Domitian. Nerva only reigned for four years. And then Trajan came upon the throne. Here is a list of those five, first five emperors in the new section, in the new dynasty. You had Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antonius Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. 
and they reigned from the year 96 AD to 192 AD. Let me share something with you about this man Trojan. Trajan, sorry. First and foremost, he was not the natural son of Nerva. He was an adopted son. As a matter of fact, with the adoption of Trajan, there came a period of 60 years in Roman history that the heir apparent to the throne of Rome was not a natural born son, but an adopted son who took over the emperorship of Rome. To me, this is a surprising fact in Roman history. Another interesting point, that while John was on the Isle of Patmos, Trajan was a very most popular general within the Roman army. He was a great warrior and a soldier, and he had one of the greatest military careers that the Roman Empire ever knew. Did you know that he is the only emperor who was never defeated in battle? <clears throat> the only one. And when he came to the throne during his reign, the Roman Empire reached its greatest extent ever in its history. And this is true fact. You can check it out. History tells us, my friend, that Trajan made the Roman Empire a name of terror among the nations that had never seen a Roman face before, or a Roman soldier. Trajan had reached the center of Asia, Parthenia, for the first time in Roman history. He got to the regions we now call Hungary and Romania, and he traveled down as far as the Persian Gulf. In fact, Trajan was the, the first and the last of all Roman generals to sail the Persian Gulf. Nobody else did it. Nobody. My wife, a few years ago, got me a set of works by an uh, Englishman, a fellow countryman, Edward Gibbons. And he wrote a history, <laughs> a commentary, on the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Now, I want you to understand that Gibbon is not a New Testament Christian. He's a heathen. But his works on the Roman Empire is something I tell you you should read. Okay? It will enlighten you. Very much so. But this is what Gibbon said about this period. The Roman Empire, the, sorry, the Roman Emperor Nerva undertook an expedition against the nations of the East. But he lamented with a sigh that his advanced age scarcely left him any hopes of equaling, of equaling the renown of his son Philip. Yet, the success of Trajan, however, transcended with rapid and, and great speed. <coughs> the dignitaries of, of the Paphians broke by inst instant discord. They fled before his armies. He descended the river Tigris in triumph from the mountains of Armenia to the Persian Gulf. He enjoyed the honor of being the first and as was the last of the Roman generals to ever negate that region of the sea. His fleet ravaged the coast of Arabia and Trajan barely flattered himself that he was approaching towards the confines of India. Every day the astonished Senate received the intelligence of news, of new names and new <coughs> nations that acknowledged his sway. He made the province of Armenia, Mesopotamia, 
Parthenia and Assyria, part of Rome. And once more establish the Euphrates as the frontier of the whole empire. Now, my friends, that's an astonishing record for someone in those days, and he was not defeated in battle. And remember, these years were events that were shortly to come to pass. So Trajan was a victorious emperor and general. In fact, Trajan was acknowledged by the Romans themselves as being one of the greatest emperors since Julius Caesar. This also is a matter of fact, and you can check that out in your history lessons. So this became a, a period of triumph, of war. And what was more important than triumph and war, that this was a long period of eternal peace and prosperity within the Roman Empire. Gibbons also writes in his work, if men were called to fix the period of history of the world during which the conditions of human race was most prosperous and happy, he would without hesitation name that which elapsed from the death of Domitian to the ascension of Commodus. And Trajan was a chief figure in those events. So what about this bow? We all know that the Roman weapon of war was what? The sword, the 18-inch sword, sword, sharp on both sides, for in combat fighting, inside combat fighting. A matter of fact, the Roman coinage for the emperor almost symbolized on the back either of the a short sword or a javelin. But this person has a bow. Now, there were ancient bowmen in the Roman world. As a matter of fact, we, we talk about the uh, Thessalon Thessalonian horsemen, the Parthenian spearmen, and the Cretan bowmen. So the bow was a natural weapon of Crete. So what does this then rule out Trojan? Uh, Trajan? No, it's not one bit at all. Because beginning with Julius Caesar, there were 12 Roman Caesars of pure blood, and Domitian was the last of them. Nerva set up a new line of Caesars that were not full blooded Roman. And furthermore, as I said, Trajan was not fully blooded Roman. According to um, Dicenius, the Greek historian who lived at 155 to 235 AD, which is close to this period, and also according to Allurius Victor, Trojan came from the island of Crete. He was a Cretan. <laughs> and so was, and his natural weapon of war was the bow. So in Trojan, I believe, we have a man who fits the requirements of this first seal. He reigned from 98 AD to 117 AD. He was crowned. The crown was given to him. It wasn't actually his. And that's very important. That's why I said you have to look at the details and understand what the details are saying. So you can accept what I've said, you can accept it, or you can reject it. That's your choice. That's your choice. Now I've said that, you may expect at what worth. Does it make any sense? Well, it makes a lot of sense to me. A lot of sense. Because history always, if you want to understand prophecy, you have to understand it in the light of history. Because history points back to the events. Prophecy points forward to an event. And we must always keep that in mind. As I've mentioned, that there are many who believe and they have their opinion to believe it. That this 
rider represents Jesus riding the white horse. They say that what follows the rider has no lasting concern because the land is a conquering gentleman. And that the same thing that Jesus has already won the victory. Yes, we do see Jesus later on in the Revelation, chapter 19 11, riding a white horse. The first question you have to ask where is he riding that white horse? Is it on earth? Because this first symbol, this first seal, talks about earth. In Revelation chapter 19 11, you see Jesus riding the white horse in heaven. That's one thing you have to keep in mind. Okay? So, let me ask you another thing to keep in mind. Where do we find Jesus today? In heaven. We don't find him on earth, do we? The other problem I have with this, of trying to make this right of Jesus, is the fact that, is Jesus ever going to put his foot on planet Earth again? No. Jared? Well, just from a basic literary sense, who's opening the seals? That's right. If he's on Earth, how can he open the seals in heaven? So, well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense, because if the Lamb is the man, Christ, mm -hmm. and he's opening the seals, it wouldn't make sense for him to open the seal and then, like, I'll be right back and go get on a horse and come out. That's right. That's another point I was going to make, too. This is a very good point, Jim. Let me ask you another question. What nationality was Jesus? Nationality? Huh? What? He's a Hebrew, a Jew. What nationality is the writer, according to the Bible? A Cretan. So how can Jesus be a Jew and a Cretan at the same time? Completely different nationalities. And so when you put all these things together, I personally cannot say that this writer in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, is the Lord himself. Because the identities are completely different. And when Jesus comes again, where are we to meet him? On planet Earth? In the earth, in the heavens. So it makes sense in chapter 19, verse 11, that he rides a white horse in the heavens. And that's how I conclude that this is a completely different rider that is on planet earth, or was on planet earth. Okay? So that may shock some of you that I view that as being that. But everyone is entitled to their opinion. And I'm not knocking anyone who says that they believe that this writer is Jesus. That's their view. No, I didn't do it. And that's yeah. their understanding. Okay. I was making sure it wasn't. Safe. And we have to give it grace. Because I'm not in power. Oh, I could be totally wrong. But I think yeah, I'm right at this point. Because we have to start at exactly the right time in history, or else we'll get everything else wrong. And that's it. Next week we're going to talk about hopefully the next two or three horses, okay? And the next one is red. Try and do your homework, find out what red is, and where this comes up in history, okay? Thank you so much, I really appreciate it.